We hope you had a meaningful Veterans Day, and to those who have served in the military, we thank you for your service. We're so glad you're joining us for Church Online this morning. I have several announcements to share with you today. We have two ways for you to serve with us in November. First is through November's Mission Focus. We'll be collecting unwrapped Christmas presents from Mission Southside's Tree of Hope. Choose the items you would like to donate from the Tree of Hope in the church lobby and place these unwrapped gifts inside the missions bin anytime in November. If you donate gift cards, please place the gift cards inside the box on the welcome desk. Thank you for your donations. You can also serve with us by helping us decorate for Christmas on Sunday, November 26th at 12.30 p.m. Pizza lunch will be provided. Let us know you're coming by emailing Ashley Huber. Finally, you're invited to our Sound of Freedom event on Sunday, November 19th at 3 p.m. We'll be watching the movie Sound of Freedom in this worship center. Cornerstone missionary Charlie Lamento will introduce the movie, and then we'll lead a discussion around human trafficking once it ends. RSVP online at cornerstoneks.org social. As always, these announcements and other resources can be found by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thank you for being a part of what we're doing here at Cornerstone. Good morning, church. Join me this morning for our call to worship out of Genesis 1. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Amen. Let's worship the Lord our Creator this morning.
Well, we have begun a new series today called The Big Story. It's our opportunity to look at the scripture from the perspective of how God reveals himself to us. And in that big story, we see that there's four chapters in the Bible called Creation, Fall, Redemption, and Restoration. And that gives you the themes of what the Bible says. And so each week we're going to read a statement uh, that is maybe a statement of faith or a confession of faith that reflects the statement of that particular day. So today we're going to be looking at the idea of creation, the first chapter in the story, that God is the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. And so let's recite together a statement that's called, Our World Belongs to God. Our world belongs to God, not to us or earthly powers, not to demons, fate, or chance. The earth is the Lord's. In the beginning, God, Father, Word, and Spirit, called the world into being out of nothing, and gave it shape and order. God formed the land, the sky, and the seas, making the earth a fitting home for the plants, animals, and humans he created. The world was filled with color, beauty, and variety, and provided room for work and play, worship and service, love and laughter. God rested and gave us rest. Well, in the beginning, everything was very good, As God's creatures, we are made in his image to represent him on earth, to live in loving communion with him. By sovereign appointment, we are earth keepers and caretakers, loving our neighbor, tending the creation, and meeting our needs. God used our skills in the unfolding and well-being of his world. That's a great statement for us to contemplate as we consider God as the maker of heaven and earth and our responsibility in light of it. Because God entered into a relationship with us, he invites us to bring our prayers before him, to bring our concerns and worries, the things that bother us, and to know that God hears and responds, God answers, and God works in us and through us. So let's go before the Heavenly Father in prayer. Oh Lord, today you will remind us that you are the creator, the maker of heaven and earth, and that you were the one who made us, and we are your creatures. And so, Father, we pray that in your work in us today, we would understand your role and our role, our responsibility in light of who you are, that you are the one who has made us and made us to be in relationship with you. So we thank you that even in creation, we see your love toward this world and especially to us as mankind. And so we thank you for the love that you've showed us in creating the beauty of this world. And this world truly does belong to you. And we thank you for all that it contains. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to to not worship the things you created, but to worship you as our creator. To not fall in love with the things of this world, but instead to make you the center of our hearts. So we pray in the hearing of your word that you would shape us and mold us. Teach us how to think and how to uh, use philosophy to understand who you are and what you're doing in this world. We thank you that you are the one who provides all things for your people and that you made us and you've even given us this day as a day of rest. And we ask that you would allow our souls to rest in you, to find strength in being in your presence today, to be refreshed and renewed for a a whole new week that comes with many other situations and circumstances that might cause us to forget you. So, Lord, we pray that in what we hear that we would never forget, that we would always remember that we would be able to taste and see of your goodness as we gather in your presence this morning. And we thank you, Lord, that we can pray for one another. We can pray for those that are sick, those that are hospitalized, those who have lost a loved one, maybe those that are struggling in their marriage, maybe someone has lost their job. Lord, in all these ways, we bring that before you and ask that you would tend to your people, that you would minister to them, that your loving hand of comfort would be upon them, and they would sense your presence with them that they would understand your grace and mercy has been overflowing to them. Would you use this time to minister to their hearts? And Lord, we thank you that as we sit under your word today, you will do the work of training us for becoming the people you want us to be. You'll show us how to live. So would you give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear of your marvelous truths so that it would shape the very way we behave, the very way we live our life, and that we would make you the center of all things, that you would have preeminence in our hearts, that you would reign and rule over our lives because you are our creator. 
We thank you that we, you made us for relationships. We thank you that your son was sent into this world as an expression of your love for us, that he would come to redeem us. We thank you, Lord, that you've rescued us from our sin and you have set us free to now live the life that you intended us to live. So would you continue to refine us and mold us more and more into the image of your son? We pray this as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, these videos that we show as bumpers for our sermon series are just a little reminder of, of what we're going to be studying over the next four weeks. We're going to look at the big picture of the Bible, the big story, and how it unfolds for us, these wonderful themes that we need to grasp and understand. It's a great way for you to look and read through your Bible when you see these themes. And so we're going to look at all four of them, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And they're telling a story, and our services are trying to tell the exact same story of our need for Christ because of the fallen world that we live in. But we are reminded, though, that God created this world. He was the maker of heaven and earth, and he was the one who brought everything into existence. He brought you into this world. It wasn't your mom. It wasn't your dad. God created you. And he set for you a time and a purpose to live in this world. And it's mind-boggling to contemplate that he had you in the understanding of his mind, and he created you. And he created you for a relationship with him. And so that's what the first chapter is going to talk about that we're going to look at today of creation. But then we look around our world and we see all the, the brokenness and the disaster that we see in our world of how we treat one another, how this world has gone so terribly wrong. We see the pain and the sorrow all around us. And so what's remarkable is that the Bible is going to tell you that God did not leave the world in that kind of state. And one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3.16, said that God so loved the world that he sent his son into this world to redeem it, to rescue it, to restore it. And so that's the third chapter of the Bible that tells you the themes. And then as you read these different books, the different books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of these books are showing you part of the story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And the scriptures remind us then that there is a time coming when Jesus will bring all of it to its consummation, that he'll bring it to its end and we'll have the new heavens and the new earth established. You see, we're not going away from here to heaven. Heaven will be coming down to earth and Jesus will renew this world and renew the heavens and renew the earth. And God will reign with us forevermore for all of those who have put their faith and trust in God. That's the story of the Bible in a nutshell. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. I'd love for you to memorize that, to put it to, in your mind so that you'll always keep that in the back of your mind as you're reading a passage of Scripture and you're trying to understand what is the Lord teaching you, what is he telling you in these stories. He's telling you about his power and his majesty, and it begins with the chapter that we're going to look at today, the very first book of the Bible, the very first sentence. And it's going to remind us that this story is not about us. It's about God and what he's done for us. That's what the Bible is all about. So if you're looking to the Bible to tell you all about yourself, yes, you're going to see yourself in it. You're going to see your need for a redeemer, your need to be rescued and restored. But it's going to tell you about what God did in order for that to happen. 
And the Bible elevates God to be the center of our story and the center of our lives. And so the creation story we'll look at this morning. Back on Christmas Eve in 1968, the Apollo 8 had launched a few days earlier. It took 64 hours to get to the orbit of the moon, and then during that day on Christmas Eve, they orbited the moon 10 times. For the very first time, these men that were in this rocket were able to see Earth from that kind of perspective, and the moon now close up. I was walking outside the other night when there was a full moon, and I just looked up, and I said, I marveled that there it's reflecting light, and the Lord uses the reflection of the sun off the moon to give us light at night. And you marvel that God was the one who placed it there. When I look at the Hubble telescope, and you look at the pictures that NASA prints on their web page and gives you pictures of what's going on as that telescope will have that little device is going further and further into the galaxy and you begin to marvel. This is so mind-blowing to look at and to watch and to see. But those men in that rocket, as they circled the moon 10 times, they broadcast on television that night. It was the most watched television show up until that time. Most of the world was watching because it was something new for them to do. And they read this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from darkness. And God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the very first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. You see, those astronauts read the first 10 verses of Genesis chapter 1 to a world that was watching with awe and splendor at the pictures that were being sent back to the earth. Many seeing it for the very first time, earth from heaven's perspective. What a mind-blowing experience that is. But did you hear what the scriptures are saying? And I'm going to read the rest of the chapters so that you'll hear the very beginning of the story, how it all began, the question that we wonder about. How did it all come into existence? Well, the Bible has an answer for you and me to understand, and it's very different than how the world will tell you. It's very different than what your professor in college is going to teach you or your teacher in public school is going to teach you. It's contrary to what the world believes. But I want you to notice how many times the word God is used. 35 times in this one chapter it is used here. So listen to the rest of the story. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruits, trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning on the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God sent them into the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. 
to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And then God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves which, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And then God said, let earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. You see, God was not alone when this happened. And he let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. That's the big story about what God is doing in creation. The story of God being the one who is the maker of heaven and earth. And so it begins with a very famous line. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the very first statement that the Bible wants you to hear about who this God is that you worship and what it's all about in this world that we believe in and what does it imply? It tells us that before the world came into existence, God existed. God existed before anything existed at all. He had no beginning and has no end. God has always existed. But this world that we live in had a point of beginning. It had a date, which we do not know. The scriptures don't tell us that date. But it does tell us that God created this world that we live in. In all of its splendor, and all of its glory, he was the one who made it. He was the one who shaped it and formed it. He was the one who filled it with all these things. And that's the essence of what Christianity is teaching, that we as human beings were created by another. We were created by God to worship him and for him. And that's how the story begins. But it also tells us that he was not alone there. We are reminded that he was there, the spirit of God was hovering over the earth. It tells us in verse 2, it tells us later on when he's creating the mankind, it says, let us create him in our image. There he uses the plural, and he's talking about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And the scriptures are going to declare that they were all actively involved in the creation of this world. Derek Kidner, a great Old Testament scholar, said this, it's no accident that God is the subject of the first sentence of the Bible. For this word dominates the whole chapter and catches the eye at every point of the page. It's used some 35 times in as many verses of the story. And the passage, indeed the book, is about him first of all. To read it with any other primary interest, which is all too possible for you and me, it is to misread it. 
See, that's powerful for us to understand that we need to remember the Bible is about what God has done for us and what he's doing in this world and what he will do in the ages to come. God is the center of the story. And that's the only conclusion you can make from these passages of scripture that we're going to hear in this morning. And it's explicitly clear that God is your creator. Let me recite some samples of other verses from the Bible. We'll go to Nehemiah chapter 9 first. Remember, Nehemiah has been living in Babylon, and he's sad that the walls of Jerusalem had fallen down, and then he asks the king, Cyrus, to allow him to be liberated and take people back and start rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the temple walls and the city walls of Jerusalem. But here he recites what he wanted the people to know about this God that they worship. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heavens of heavens with all of their hosts and the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. He's introducing you to the God of the scriptures. Isaiah 45, verse 12, I made the earth and created man on it. It's God speaking through Isaiah. The Lord had told Isaiah, tell them, this is what I say. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. Or John 1, the famous passage in the New Testament, chapter, verse 2 and 3, the word was with God in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Or Romans 1.19 is going to tell us a picture about this world that we live in. For what can be known about God is plain to the world, to believer and unbeliever, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes... Namely, his eternal power and divine nature. Those are two of his attributes. There's many more, but Paul wants to list these two. These two things were on display, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. You see, that's what we need to grasp. His eternal power is seen in his creation. His divine nature is seen in his creation. In the things that have been made, so that we are now without excuse. We can't say we don't know God. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him because they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Paul wanted the church at Rome to understand this is what the world does. They see his divine power. And they see his beautiful attributes that are seen in looking at this world. But they have suppressed that truth. And they have not listened to the voice of creation. And instead have begun to worship things that they make with their own hands or maybe some of the things that this world contains. And they made idols out of birds and carved out of rock idols that they would worship instead of remembering their creator. That's what's wrong with the world. That's the fallenness that we're going to talk about next week. Why it has led to disaster because we've ignored the one who created us. Let's go on to Colossians 1.15. We preached through Colossians a few years ago. He is the image of the invisible God. He's referring to Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. You see, the message is telling you again, you were created for God, for a relationship with him. And then the last book of the Bible, so we've hopped, skipped, and jumped through the whole story of the Bible, and here's what it says, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Oh, let there be no mistake in understanding what the Bible says about God and about itself. God is the creator. He made everything that we see visible and invisible. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And that's why in our creeds, like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, the very first statement is 
something like this. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, in our Presbyterian and Reformed background, we have a, a confession that's called the Westminster Confession, and they amalgamated all of these passages of Scripture and gave a summary of what it taught. And so in chapter 4, the Westminster Confession, it talks about creation. And here's the very first article in that chapter. It says this, It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power and wisdom and goodness, in the beginning, to create or make out of nothing the world and everything in it, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all was very good. That's their summary. As you read the scriptures that I've just given to you, you can see that they took little snippets and put that together and gave us that definition of what God is doing in creation. It's contrary to what our culture teaches you see, our culture is going to tell you and it's going to tell your children if you send them to college or to school that there is no God. That there's no meaning and purpose in this world. Just enjoy what you can do. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you die. And you'll be food for worms. And that becomes the motto, the understanding of the world that doesn't believe in a God. Doesn't believe in the supernatural. And if they're honest, they have to admit that then there's no meaning and purpose in life because when we hear that God created you and me, it should help you understand that your life certainly has great meaning and great purpose. And to hear that you've been created in the image of God gives you even a greater understanding of your dignity and your worth in this world. In a world that doesn't show dignity and worth to anything. A world that is so self-consumed and self-centered. But in creation, we see God being selfless, creating this world for us to enjoy, and we become the pinnacle of his creation. And he makes us the center of his creation. And the humanist, the, the world that doesn't believe in God, teaches something completely different. I don't know if you've ever read the man, uh, Humanistic Manifesto. There was three iterations of it, one done in the 1930s, another one done in 1972, and a later on, and people signed the declaration. And so if you read the signees of the Humanist Manifesto, you're going to see some famous names of people that were philosophers or professors in colleges and campuses around the world, famous people who signed, and here are some of the things that they said. Here's an example of how the world thinks they said religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. It diametrically opposes the very first words of the Bible. Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Oh, we find insufficient evidence of, for belief in the existence of a supernatural God, but we certainly find enough evidence to believe in the Big Bang Theory that all of this came out of chance, mathematically, that's almost impossible for that to happen, and believe that that's how all of this came into existence. As non-theists, meaning they don't believe in God, we begin with humans, not God. Nature, not deity. You see, the Bible begins with God and then man. You see the complete opposite. You see how our culture is contrary to what we as Christians believe, what the scriptures teach about it. And then it says we can discover no divine purpose or providence for human species. These were all statements that they signed gladly to say in this world what we should believe. And humans are responsible for what we are or what we will become. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. You see how contrary that is to the scriptures. God says these verses that he gives to us, he says what is revolutionary. So different from how the world thinks and looks upon itself and upon themselves. You see, God is the master painter and creation is his canvas. And he's showing you the beauty of his power and his strength and his might and his beauty and his grace. 
in what he's created. And when you see the birds in the air and when you see the, the fish in the sea and when you look at the mountains and the rivers, they're telling a story. They're proclaiming that they were made by something greater than themselves. And this is why the psalmist in Psalm 19 would write these famous words. You've heard them before. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So he begins with the very first sentence to try to tell you this, that when you look into the sky at nighttime and you drive home and you see the beautiful color of pinks and purples and as the sun is going down, maybe the bright oranges and you see the fall sky, you can tell the difference between the fall sky and the summer sky. You begin to see how beautiful it is and you need to understand the psalmist is saying, when you see it, it's like a giant billboard saying, God created this. Day to day, All of these things pour out speech. Night to night, they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set the tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And this psalmist marvels at God's creation. And what he's telling you and me is that all of creation cries out that God exists. And if all of creation, as we heard the song that we were just singing, if all of creation would do that, why would we not do that? That's why we've been made. That's the kind of relationship we're to have with God, that we would cry out with praise and glory and honor to his name because we have been created and created in his image. He didn't have to create us at all. But out of love, he did. And his attributes, his attributes of love are seen in how we love one another. And so we bear the image of God. We are the only part of creation that has that name, being image bearers of God. And so the whole story in chapter 1 is leading up to that point that mankind is very different than every other day of creation that was there, that man is the center. And he said, let us make man in our image. And so we've been stamped with the image of God, each and every human being. And what that means is that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that God is the creator of heaven and earth and of all that it contains. One day, every believer and every unbeliever will be faced with the reality of meeting their creator face to face. You see, because when God speaks, he brings into existence. So as you heard each day, and God said, let there be light, let there be swarming things, let there be creeping things, let there be mankind made in our image. He speaks them into existence. That's how powerful God is. It's too hard for us to even comprehend that kind of power. And God introduces us to himself in these verses of scripture, telling us who he is and what kind of God he is. J.I. Packer is one of my favorite theologians. He wrote this. He said, the message of these two chapters, which he's referring to chapter one and two of Genesis, is this. You've seen the sea, the sky, the sun, the moon, and stars. You've watched the birds and the fish, and you have observed the landscape and vegetation, the animals and insects, and all the big things and little things together. You've marveled at the wonderful complexity of human beings with all of their power and skills, and the deep feelings of fascination and attraction and affection that men and women arouse in each other. Fantastic, isn't it? Well, now, meet the one who's behind it all. As if you say, now that you have enjoyed these works of art, you must shake hands with the artist. Since you were thrilled by the music, we'll introduce you to the composer. It was to show us the creator rather than the creation and to teach us knowledge of God rather than the physical science that Genesis 1 and 2, along with such celebrations of creation in Psalm 104 or Job 38 and 41 were written. They were all written to tell you who the artist is, 
Who is the composer? Who is the one who created it all? It's not you. It's not me. It's God. So then consider some of the implications of that revolutionary thought. That means that you were made for a relationship with God. That he made you for a purpose. And he gives you meaning and purpose in your life. And he created you in his image so you then go walking around stamped with him in you and over you and through you. And as you go about living your life upon this earth, you are reflecting God like the sun reflects its light on the moon and gives light for all to see. You see, we're glittering images of what God wants the world to see. And he's made you in that way. And that's the reality that you've been made by God. And you are his creation. You were not made to worship his creation, but instead you were made to worship him. So you eat, you drink, you play, and whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God, Paul says. So he takes the very thought of our culture that would say, eat and drink and be merry and tomorrow you die, but he's going to say, eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow you have purpose and meaning and a reason for existence because God has given that to you. He is to be your God and you're to be his people. And because of that, because God is the creator, he also has authority over your life. So we need to reflect and think about this for a moment. What place have you given God as your creator? Where is he in your heart? Is he in first place or is he a couple of chairs away from the center? There when you need him, there when things go wrong, but during the day, most of your life, you live as you being the king, where God was rightly made to reign and rule because he is your creator. He's the one who has authority over you. You were stamped with his image, and you are to look like him in this world as his created being. I like how Paul Tripp said it. There is someone who is at the center of all things, there's someone who rules over the heavens and the earth. There's someone who defines what pure love and power and wisdom and faithfulness and righteousness and grace look like. There's someone who controls the forces of physical nature and administrates the events of human history. There's someone who authors the plot details of the story of every human being who has ever lived. There is someone who is worthy of honor and dominion and power. There is someone who is deserving of complete allegiance and unending worship of everyone. You see, there is someone at the center, and it's not us. It will never be about us because we have been born into a world that is, by its fundamental nature, a celebration of one greater than us. So when you look around and you see fellow human beings... The voice is telling you that God is the creator of mankind. And he is to have first place in your life in light of it. He's to have authority over you and what you do with your life. He reigns and rules over you because he made you. But we're going to see that the story was that we rebelled we turned against our creator and we wanted to be the creator instead. And we'll see what havoc it's reaped upon this world, what it's sown as we hear the rest of the story. But today we're reminded that God is the maker of heaven and earth. He is the creator that made you for a relationship with him. And because him being the creator, he now has authority over your life. So how will you live in light of that? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we begin to hear the story that reigns throughout all of your scriptures that tell us the beauty of your power, your divine nature is evident in all that we see and Lord, yet we have forgotten you. 
And yet, Lord, we have made idols out of the things that you've created instead of worshiping you. So we thank you, though, that this table that we're going to come to in a minute is a reminder of you loving this world so much that you would send your son to die. And if we put our faith and trust in him and believe in him, we'll have eternal life. So we thank you that we have a redeemer. We thank you that you love this world enough that you wouldn't leave it in its fallen condition, but you would send your son to mount upon a cross and nail every sin that we would commit in our lives to that cross and never have it count against us again. So Lord, would you help us to taste and see the beauty of your grace and mercy and your love toward us? Would you help us see the, the supper and the cross in a whole new way today? And be reminded of your power, reminded of your love, reminded of, of the extent that you would go to rescue us. So use this table now to give us a greater understanding of your love toward us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I see your face in every sunrise. The colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, you're beautiful.
Well, we've just heard about the first chapter in this big story about who God is. And it reminds us that He is the Creator. And He's made us to have a relationship with Him. And He's made us to have authority over our lives because He is the Creator. And so we're asked that question, what place does He have in our hearts? What place does He have in your life? And so that today we are reminded that he is to be having preeminence in our hearts and in our lives, that we would make him the center of all that we do, that we would worship him and praise him and bring glory to him because all of creation cries out glories to his name because of what he has done. So as you travel, as you explore the world and you see all of its beauty, may you be reminded that God is the one who created it and God has created you for purpose and for meaning in this world. And may he bless you as you leave and depart from us today. Would his blessing be upon you now. May the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. God bless and see you next week.